the Hillcrest Church video. We hope this message will help you grow. Good morning. So Christian got to stand down here last week. I wanted to try it out. See, it's like down on the ground level. My name's Tim. I get to be uh, serve on pastoral staff here and get to teach and do some other things and um, love getting to do it. Um, we, uh, d before we get started, I just want to make sure a logistic thing is straightened out. I would love it. We're going to be working on this um, passage, Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And throughout the room are giant pieces of paper um, with Matthew 22, 41 through 46. I would love if everyone had one of these giant pieces of paper. So I want to take a minute right now and logistically see where we're at on this. So um, can, if you have extras at your table, can you lift them up? Maybe we'll pass them around. Is there anybody who doesn't have any? We don't have some over here. Here, you've got some extras. Here's some extras, Christian. You want to take the extra? Oh, yep. Yeah. Anybody who else who doesn't have any? There's one in the back that needs one. A couple in the back that needs some. Are we getting? Oh, there's one in the back that needs some. Thank you for the help. Just I know we have enough in the room. We just kind of have to figure out where they all go. Are we figuring it out? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so as you may have noticed, uh, there are tables in the room. Um, today, we are in this series uh, this summer. We're looking at questions Jesus asked. And so just for the summer, we're sitting around tables and there is some um, voluntary interaction uh, during this, this series. And it's, this is not a permanent thing. We're going to go back uh, to our uh, usual way in the fall. But if you, I just want to, if you're newer with us or today's your first day or you're, you're a family member here for a dedication, you're like, what, do they always do it? This? No, we don't. And um, you're not going to be asked to do, nobody's going to be put on the spot. And if you don't want to participate in any of the interactive that you can just Cross your arms and look at the ceiling and we, it'll all be fine, right? Like we're not like the goal. Look, the goal isn't to make people uncomfortable. The goal is just kind of a fun, different way of interacting in the summertime. So that's what we're doing. Um, but today the topic, um, the topic is going to be, we're talking about um, being uh, curious scripture readers. The question that Jesus asked, he asked this question dealing with um, a text. He, he says to some people, he says, what do you think? What do you think about this? And then he actually asks a series of follow-up questions. But he challenges them. He challenges them not just, to, not just to kind of take what they've been, not what's been handed to them, the way they've always thought about it. But he's like, have you really thought about this and dug into this and asked questions about this and wrestled with this? What do you think? This is actually, this, this way of engaging with Scripture, um, you know, has long history in the community of followers of God. So Gregory the Great, a Christian thinker from 1,500 years ago, he had this quote where he said, Scripture is shallow enough that a lamb can wade in it and deep enough that an elephant can swim in it. And the idea being, of course, that, you know, kids, like elementary school kids, they can get the idea that in, the, the, the scripture talks about loving God and loving people, right? Young children can understand life is about loving God and loving people. And yet the most, like the most, um, you know, deep thinking men and women can spend their lives digging into this scripture and learning Hebrew and Greek and studying how does the Trinity work and, and how does God interact with the world and providence and free will. Like uh, we can spend our lives digging in, but there's this, there's both, it's accessible to kids and there's this depth that you cannot exhaust. Um, before Gregory the Great, the rabbis um, had this saying when talking about Torah, they said Torah is like a diamond with 70 facets. You can turn it around and around and continue to find new angles of beautiful truth to look at, right? That you continue to look at this. And so I want to encourage us today to be curious scripture readers because I think curiosity is, is, is an expression of love. Like we can approach this text with love or unlove in our hearts, there are some people that read scripture in very unloving ways. They come to it with cynicism and skepticism. But we can also read it with love. Like curiosity is an expression in relationships of love. I know in my family with uh, our kids, we end every night with questions and tickles. 
<laughs> because questions. What's your favorite food? Well, who's your friend today? What was something beautiful you saw today? Questions, seeking to under someone. It's an expression of love. And so too, when we read this text, we read these scriptures to bring our questions as an expression of love. I want to understand the God who interacted with the men and women in this story. And so that's what we're going to do today. And uh, the way we're going to do it is you've got these big pieces of paper. And my hope is that all morning long, starting, starting now, you can write questions. I want you to fill this margin in with like a thousand questions. All sorts of questions. Any question that comes to your mind about this scripture or what the scripture might mean or things you'd wish you could investigate or learn about it or questions that raise your mind about God, write questions down in here. And if you want to do colorful questions, the kids' tables in the room have colored pencils and markers. And you can just borrow those for the next, whatever, 25 minutes. Grab some colored pencils, grab some markers, fill this in with questions. While I'm talking, write questions, write questions, write questions. So I'm going to read the passage, and then we're going to begin kind of giving you some time to um, really write in all kinds of questions down here. So the passage for the morning is Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And I want to set the context up and then read it for us. The, the, the event that we're stepping into is something occurred at the very end of Jesus' life. This is, uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish nation. In fact, he's in the heart of Jerusalem, the temple area. And he is interacting with his religious leaders, the Pharisees. And it's just days before he is betrayed and arrested and executed. So this is like the, the um, conflict be between him and the re religious leaders is coming to a point, right? And he has this, um, he has these series of like verbo jujitsu matches with the different like religious leaders. And they're arguing about different things and he's proving different points. But he has this debate with the Pharisees. Then he declares woes over them. Then he says Jerusalem itself will be destroyed. And then it moves on to his final supper. And so this is, things are coming to a head between Jesus and the religious leaders. And this is what we read. Matthew 22, 41 through 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, Jesus said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him, the Messiah, Lord? For he says, this is David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Now, I hope that raised some questions in your mind and be writing them down. But just a quick summary of um, what is happening here. And it's just so interesting because we are just get, like we are asking questions about a scripture where Jesus is asking questions about a scripture. It's very meta. And um, so uh, what like what's happening? Um, Jesus, he's having this debate with the Pharisees and he um, you know, he says, like, who do you think the Messiah is? And they say, well, he's the son of David. He's a descendant of David. He's just like a mini David. And Jesus says, if he's just a mini David, how is it that in this, this song, Psalm 110, that uh, is a psalm of David that David wrote, that David refers to this future king as my Lord or my king? If he's just like a later on mini David, he wouldn't call him my king. How does that work? And the Pharisees are basically like, um, no, they, and they just walk away. So that's what takes place. So here's the thing. So for you, what I want us to do now, um, what I want you to think about, if you were going to like in, interpret this passage, figure out what's going on, like a detective kind of salt, like what is happening here? What does this mean? What are the questions that you would be asking to figure out what this passage is on about? 
So um, take a minute, write them on there. I'm going to put some example questions on the screen, but just begin writing all the different who, what, where, when, why, how questions that come to your mind to interpret this event. Go. Now, I'm sure you could keep writing questions, but what I want you to do now is with a couple other, one or two other people around you, I want you just to share one, one of the questions that you wrote down, or if you didn't write anything down, just one question you were thinking about. Like, this is a question I might ask. And just share with one or two people around you either a question you wrote down or a question that you had been thinking about. And go. All right, I'm going to pull us back together there. I'm sure you can keep talking about that. But um, if someone, uh, you know, you're sharing different questions, now I want to give us a chance to just share with the whole group. If you not, don't, I don't want to hear the question you asked, but if a question that you heard someone else share struck you, I'd love for you to share it with the whole group. So what, what are some of the questions that you heard asked that you're like, oh, that really struck you? Why don't you just share them out with all of us? I know you were talking. I heard you talking out there. <laughs> Why didn't Jesus just say who he was? He's kind of this oblique way of getting or talking around his identity. Yeah, interesting question. Why didn't he do it this way? Other questions? Who really am I? Who, who is Jesus really? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Challenge their paradigm. Yeah, he's, he's pressing into their paradigm of who is he, who is the Messiah. Exactly. Interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. What was his? Purpose. What was his purpose? Yeah. It, really interesting. Like, why does he do it this way? And then you can even kind of go to the next level. Why does Matthew? Why does Matthew, the author, record this? Why does he think it's so important? Yeah. What is the purpose? A great, important question of any text. Yes. One, yeah. Why didn't they ask him more Why did the Pharisees not ask you more questions? They're just kind of like, we're out, we're done, you win. Yeah, why? Interesting. Which, of course, you could go back. Where, where is Jesus in his relationship with the Pharisees? What's happened between him and the Pharisees up to this point? Why would they give? Yeah, and I'm sure we could ask more questions, but that's, those are exactly kind of things that you would be wanting to dig into. I want to kind of push. So we start, we're going to push farther into this. Deeper questions. Okay, you ready? Yes would be the proper answer to that question. Okay, so um, uh, Matthew, th this text is from, is one of four ancient biographies about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? These four ancient biographies that tell about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, um, three of them record this event Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this event. John doesn't even record it. But the three of them that do record the event all do it a little bit differently. So up on the screen, here we've got this picture. In a set, there it is. Uh, Matthew is on the left. Mark is in the center. Luke is on the right. And it, now I realize it might be hard to read. The point isn't to read every word up there. But I want, you, I want to give you a sense for the way these three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all compare. So the purple is where Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story the exact same way. The green is where Matthew and Mark tell the story the same way, but Luke's different. The blue is where Mark and Luke tell the story the same way, but Matthew is different. And if it's not highlighted, that means that's where that author told it in a unique way. Now, the point isn't to like memorize or kind of know the exact differences. The point is each one of these authors emphasized and de-emphasized different things, brought out different details and suppressed different, because they were trying to make a point about Jesus that was part of their larger work. And it's just so, and then, you, you know, you begin to think about it. So you've got the author of Matthew writing, and you've got, think about all the levels happening here. You've got Matthew telling this story in a specific way for a specific audience in the late first century, right? Talking about Jesus, who is addressing the Pharisees in the early first century. Talking about David, who is writing a psalm a thousand years before to the people of Israel. Talking about a time where Yahweh, the God of Israel, addressed David personally. Do you see all those levels that are occurring here? 
Interesting. All right, with all that in mind, I want you now to turn to this. You've got those same groups, two or three people. Turn to them and just what is the first question that pops up into your mind when you think about, and can we, can, actually, can we hold the three columns up there for a minute? What's the first question that pops into your mind when you think about the way Matthew crafted this and all the different levels at work here? Turn to a person and share with it. And if you want to write questions down, do that at the same time. Go. All right, let's pull back together in the whole group and keep me right, writing these questions down. I would love to see the margins of these papers all filled in um, as you hear questions. But again, I, so you shared some questions with somebody or a couple people with you. Again, not your question, but somebody else's question that struck you. Why don't, why don't you just share it out so we all can hear one of the questions that struck you? One of the primary reasons was the audience for each, each of the different. Yeah. Who was the audience for each difference? Matthew's more about yeah. you telling the long and the fulfillment. Is this a statement or a question you're giving me right now? Huh? Are you giving me a statement or a question? Yeah. What's your question? Well, well the, the question was, is it organized the way it is because mainly because of the audience? Yeah. All the, the white. Are the different Gospels pointed at different audiences and what would, might their purposes for those different audiences be? Great question. <laughs> Scott's question. Great question, Scott. Yeah, love it. What other questions came up? I'm very patient. Is it a fulfillment of prophecy? Yeah. No, I think that's a great question. Yeah, what is, is, what is, is this a prophecy? How does that work? And then is this fulfilled already or about to be fulfilled? Or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating question. Great question, Charlie. One more question. Yeah, the, kind of getting into the, the fine tooth details of the differences. Matthew has this interaction with the Pharisees. Mark has it with the crowds. Luke seem, it seems more just kind of vague. What's going on there? I mean, you could ask what really happened. You could ask what, what are the purposes of these different authors? What are they getting at? What are they hoping we notice from that? I think those are great questions. Yeah, cool. We're going to go a little bit deeper, okay? Hang with me here. So um, just to kind of uh, pull back again. So Jesus here, he is, he's pushing on their understanding of what the Messiah is, who the Messiah is. And he does this by quoting Psalm 110 verse 1. And I want to go back to Psalm 110 verse 1 and read that for us. And just kind of pull out the distinctive Hebrew of it, um, just so we kind of get a sense for what Jesus' argument is here. So Psalm 110 verse 1 says something like this. Yahweh, that's the name for God, I am who I am. Yahweh says to my Lord, my Adonai, my king or my ruler. So even though in English it's Lord said to my Lord, in Hebrew it's actually two different words. Yahweh says to my ruler, and this is what Yahweh says to my ruler. And remember, David is the author of this. Yahweh is saying this to David's ruler. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. So this Psalm of David is referring to some future king who David refers to as his ruler, who God will make exalted. Sitting at God's right hand is like the most exalted place. God will make exalted and victorious, right? And Jesus is saying, look, Pharisees, if, if you think David, the, the Messiah is just like a mini David, how is it that David is actually calling this future king his ruler? Who is the Messiah really? Now, interestingly, um, this chapter of scripture, Psalm 110, 
when the New Testament writers are seeking to explain who Jesus is, there is no place in Scripture that they quote and allude to more often than Psalm 110. This is it. The, most, the, if, if the New Testament writers, where do they go? They go to Psalm 110. Later on in Psalm 110, it actually talks about this king being a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which is a whole nother place to ask a bunch of questions about. But this is the place the New Testament authors go to. In fact, one of Jesus' um, close followers, Peter, you've heard of the disciple Peter, after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection, it's kind of like the first time that Peter announces who Jesus is publicly. It's called, in Acts 2, it's called Pentecost, and Peter's there announcing who Jesus is. He, do you know where Peter goes to prove who Jesus is? He goes to Psalm 110 in Acts 2. He quotes it and says, he says, Peter says that in Jesus's crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, this has happened. Peter's making an argument that in his crucifixion and resurrection, God through Jesus has defeated the great enemies of sin and death and evil. And in his ascension, that Jesus of Nazareth has sat down at the most exalted position in the universe as king over all the cosmos. Peter is making this argument. And so when we go that back, though, we're not in Acts 2 today. We're in Matthew 22. We're at this really interesting place in the middle where Jesus is referring to something that was written a thousand years before about something that hasn't happened yet. And he's pressing the Pharisees on their understanding of who the Messiah is. That's interesting, right? I find that fascinating, the way Jesus is interacting with us. So um, I want to give us one more chance to write a few more questions down. So this will be kind of our, our what are your, um, after all you've heard today, I am sure you still have questions in your mind about this passage. So if you had things that you thought, these are areas that I would want to explore more, that if I had, to, if I had more time and energy, these are areas I would want to dig into further. I want to give you a chance to write that down, and we'll have some more example questions for further explanation, further exploration there. Uh, take a minute and write them down. We'll do this individually right now. Take a minute and write them down on your sheet of paper. Questions for further exploration. Go. All right, let's pull back together again. I would love to hear a few of you share after everything that we've talked about and everything we've asked about this passage. If What questions are you leaving today with where you're thinking, I would love to know more about this? This is what I'm leaving curious about. Or, you know, um, yeah, what, you know, what does this word mean? Um, how did... Uh, Jewish people in the first century understand Psalm 110. Tim, what were you trying to get at today after all? Like, what, what, are the questions, what are the questions in your mind that you'd say, I'm leaving today with these questions in my mind about this passage? Yeah. Did anyone figure out that Jesus was the Messiah by this conversation? Interesting. Did anyone from this conversation, did it click into place? Oh, this guy is the Messiah. Yeah, that's a great question. I like it. Yeah. What question should the Pharisees have asked at that time? Oh, interesting. What question should the Pharisees have asked? What, or, yeah, what response was Jesus hoping to get? Was this, was this the response he was hoping for? Or was he hoping for a different response? And it's a great series of questions. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Nicodemus, a Pharisee who shows up in the book of John, when, when did that conversation with Jesus take place chronologically to this conversation? Interesting question. Yeah. If you kind of put it in context of all the different confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees, in in if you look at chapter 22 and all these different verbal sparrings, these rabbinic jujitsu matches, how does this fit in with what else is happening? I think that's a great question. Because um, you always you want to look at the immediate context, you know, the larger context, but that immediate context as well. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah. 
doesn't make any sense. How did they, how, so you're saying, yeah, 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 what kind of, why couldn't they see what Jesus was saying? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Why, why did the Pharisees have a hard time seeing this dissonance? Yeah, mm -hmm. great question. Yeah. Is Jesus, to show them the truth. totally, because that kind of goes back to that question Guy was asking, what response was he hoping for? Is he, is he hoping to reach them or is it kind of almost like a letting them seal their own fate in regards to him kind of thing? Yeah, what, what is happening there? I think great question. Yeah. Um, so look, here's the thing. Jesus, you know, I, I wanted to bring our attention to this text because this is what I see happening there. These Pharisees, they had a, uh, a smaller view of who the Messiah was. The, the Messiah was going to be this human kind of mini David. And Jesus comes to them and he presses them. He's like, is that really who the Messiah is? Because in our own tradition, it seems like the Messiah is much greater than that. Um, Peter later on says this is confirmed in Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. But what's so interesting, I think about how Jesus does this. The way Jesus presses them is he says, he says, don't just, you've been handed this, you know, everybody knows the Messiah is dot, dot, dot. He says, don't just be satisfied with the everybody knows answer you've been handed. He says, read the scriptures more deeply for yourselves. Like be hungry, be thirsty, be curious, ask questions. Like if this is God speaking to humanity through humanly inspired answer, if that's what it is, we should come to it with great curiosity and questions and digging and wrestling. And maybe even some of the wrestling is there that it, God doesn't want to give us the easy answers. He wants us to draw us more deeply in. Christians, we've had this tradition. You know, I, I, I said earlier, Gregory, Gregory the Great said the scriptures, they're shallow enough for a lamb to wade in. Like kids can understand what it means to love God and love others, but they're deep enough for an elephant to swim in. The rabbi said uh, the Torah has 70 facets. You can keep turning it and turning it and find new beautiful realities reflected within it. And the, the, the point is that I think coming to texts that are even hard to understand that take work, I think it's an invitation to love and to listen and to say, God, I believe you have something to say to me. And I come with curious expectation. I come to dig in. I think it's an invitation to us. And my goal this morning is not to like leave you frustrated where you walk out of here and you're thinking, I feel like I know less about this than when I walked in here this morning. Like that's not my goal. And if you, my goal is not for you to feel disempowered or I don't even know how to read this stuff now. If, if you feel like, man, I don't even know how to approach scripture, come personally. I would love to help make you equipped in that. Our small groups at Hillcrest, our communities where we help one another read scripture together. In just a month, we're going to have small group signups. I'd love for you to join one of those. Um, if you need a great book to get started, there's a fantastic book. I think we have the cover image up there, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. I'll have it up here after the service. You can look at it. There's great ways to get started. So I don't want anybody to feel um, frustrated or disempowered. But I also intentionally didn't want to tie things up in a neat bow for us today. Like I want, I hope, I hope somebody this afternoon is like flipping through their Bible. What on earth did this thing mean? Like I hope you leave with questions. Because I think, I, I really do believe there's plenty of scripture that God gives. It's very clear. Love God and love others. Trust Jesus. But I also think there are things in here that are difficult and at confusing and they require wrestling. And I really do believe that God places them in there so we would engage more deeply. Because in the wrestling, in the getting stuck, in the having to dig deeper, it's an expression of engagement with God, relationship with God. And I believe love of God. And I think we all 
are invited into that. What do you think? Let's pray. Jesus, you, uh, you are the word, the word of life. And uh, Abba Father, you inspired these texts to be written down about your interactions with men and women in history, about your words uh, to us today. And you inspire them to be um, preserved through history and that you speak through them to us today. Um, you speak words of life and words of challenge and words of invitation. And I pray that we would be a community um, curious to hear what you have to say to us individually and together. In your name, amen. Thanks for connecting with Hillcrest Church. For more info on this and other sermons, visit us online at hcbellingham.com or join us at 9 or 11 a.m. any Sunday morning, 1400 Larrabee Ave, Bellingham, Washington.